Hi, I'm Marvin Natavich. I'm a medical geneticist and clinical pathologist at the Cleveland Clinic, and um, I'm excited and honored to be part of a panel discussion today talking about uh, a number of general matters in child psychiatry regarding uh, pediatric persons having autism. We have a distinguished group of academics here to talk about these general matters. They include Chuck Henry, who's a professor of child psychiatry at the Massachusetts General Hospital, uh, Dr. Agnes Whitaker, um, a professor of psychiatry at Columbia University Medical Center and the New York State Psychiatric Institute, and Bob Hendren, professor of psychiatry at UCSF. We have uh, four learning objectives for today's discussion. The first is for our viewers to feel comfortable understanding the current clinical definition of autism in a child or adult. The second is to understand a bit how the notion of autism has morphed over time uh, and uh, critiques of different notions of autism. The third objective is to uh, understand from these experts some of the more common psychiatric morbid comorbidities in children with autism, their frequencies, and how they play out in the lives of these children. And finally, we'll conclude by talking about some of the impacts of uh, having a child with autism on other siblings in the family and for the parents. Maybe Agnes, you could begin mm -hmm. the discussion. Certainly, well, as someone wisely said, when you've met one person with autism spectrum disorder, you have met one person with autism spectrum disorder. But our current um, agreed upon clinical uh, diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder as defined in the DSM-5 consists of two um, required features. Uh, one is persistent deficits in social communication and social interaction uh, as seen both in nonverbal or gestural uh, communication and also in spoken language communication, as well as um, how such a person is able to navigate the larger social demands of their culture. The second um, major um, requirement is that there be uh, repetitive behaviors or restricted interests, and uh, these include a wide range of behaviors that from stereotypies to behavior that may appear more ritualized or compulsive. Um, and in our most recent definition of autism was added hypo or hypersensitivity um, to various uh, stimuli in the environment. Uh, we, the current criteria do not require that this have an onset before the age of three, which is a, a newer aspect of our um, clinical conception of the diagnosis. Um, and there has to be um, impairment in the major areas of living and functioning. Now, you've provided us the current, the contemporary clinical definition of autism, but the notion of autism is actually many decades old and has gone through a historical morphogenesis. Maybe, Bob, you could lead us in a discussion about how there's been changes in the notion of autism over time. Sure, years ago, autism referred to this kind of within oneself, not relating to the world, not um, uh, fully connecting in the way that was that met the, the first criteria of what you talked about. The way um, people then thought of it was actually based on schizophrenia and other disorders at that time, and it put autism and schizophrenia to be together. That was a number of years ago, and over the years, it's evolved to where we've appreciated that these are two different disorders, although there are certainly some aspects that we're finding are similar in genetics and brain function, but they're not the same disorders, and yet in some countries in the world, people still confuse schizophrenia and autism and put those two together. We then went through different diagnostic schemas that um, talked about autism and repetitive behaviors, 
and language dysfunction, and it's moved along to where we're now to DSM-5, and that criteria, as uh, Dr. Whitaker just described, has a, a clearer definition, a way that we can identify people with autism. But that's led to controversies about are we over-diagnosing, are we under-diagnosing, and then also talking about what's the incidence, the number of new cases, and the prevalence, the number of existing cases. So there's hot debate among people that says there's not more autism, it's always been there, we're just now recognizing it. And I think that becomes especially true when we think about people that have higher functioning a word we don't like to use regularly, but autism, that might be on the edge, on the upper edge. And then people wonder about people that have very severe autism and are intellectually having challenges, and then people wonder, is that was that confused with mental retardation? And so are we seeing more or less is something that still is a, a debated issue. and. We all three might have a different opinion as we got through it, went through talking about it, but it's something that you'll hear discussed a lot in the field. Now, the fact that the initial concept of autism arose decades ago, and that there have been different definitions as we march through time, uh, in and of itself means that there's been controversy over this nosologic construct. Using the notion of autism as it's currently defined through, as both of you have just mentioned, the DSM-5, what are some of the controversies or complexities of the construct, um, both in terms of clinical use today and in terms of research applications? Well, I think uh, certainly uh, there's concern that autism spectrum disorder as a category, uh, categorical construct isn't the most useful um, for research because it doesn't really capture the degree of heterogeneity that is present um, in the disorder. And uh, the current uh, approach is also to remove language entirely from the construct of social communication um, and deal with it separately as a specifier of someone who has autism, but it's no longer required um, as a key component as it was in uh, the earlier DSM-4 definition of autism. Because there is so much overlap between autism spectrum disorder and other neurodevelopmental disorders and so much heterogeneity within autism, including on the basis of associated motor problems, um, associated cognitive problems, visual spatial problems. Um, one uh, possibility that's been suggested by Eric London has been to have a category of neurodevelopmental disorders with all of the various things that, or uh, domains that can go wrong in development um, listed underneath and specified for a given individual. Um, and that doing that might sort of remove a kind of hyper-focus that we have on these two key criteria uh, for um, autism spectrum disorder. Again, that's controversial. And um, I think it can be argued that clinicians have found the construct of autism spectrum disorder useful certainly it has use in education um, and in other uh, broad categories. Yeah, I would agree. I think clinically, uh, independent of research and uh, trying to look more specifically at etiology or pathways that are involved in the development of the disorder, uh, clinically the construct is um, uh, useful in organizing, I think, people's uh, uh, thinking and understanding about a certain type of uh, uh, neurodevelopmental problem that needs some specialized types of interventions and treatments. So um, 
you know, the, I think clinically there's been a bit of an adjustment with moving from DSM-4 to DSM-5 and uh, Asperger's disorder now being lumped into the broader category of autism spectrum disorders. Um, uh, but I, I, th I think still it's sort of a, a useful overall construct in trying to organize uh, a certain type of uh, uh, neurodevelopmental uh, difficulty and, um, and it, like I said, the associated treatments. So would you, Bob, be able to describe some of the more important screening tools that are used circa 2018 and from your perspective some of the strengths and limitations of those tools? It seems many times pediatricians, family practice docs, uh, sometimes it's a daycare worker, the first ones to recognize that the child is not relating in the same way that other kids do, that they may have difficulties too with repetitive, getting stuck, difficult times with transitions. So people start to suspect maybe this is autism. And one of the screeners that pediatricians in particular use is called the MCHAT. It's kind of a checklist. Others, though, might just go through the DSM-5 and look at the different criteria and say, how many is this hitting? How many things do we see? But that should lead them to getting a good diagnostic interview. The thing that's often hard about that is there's often a waiting list to get in for those kinds of state-of-the-art evaluations. But those are things that we call the ADI, the Autism Diagnostic Inventory, or the ADOS, the Autism Diagnostic Observation Schedule, and they should be administered by people that are trained in their use. Often those people are psychologists or other mental health professionals, and they've been trained to a level of reliability that can help them make that diagnosis. Many places require that the diagnosis be made that way. But some would say a trained professional who knows autism, who's gone through DSM-5 criteria or another kind of standard way of assessing things, even like the social communication questionnaire, might be enough for people to say, okay, they meet the criteria for an autism spectrum disorder and they can get services. But it's an important distinction because it's not always obvious what's autism and what isn't. And people can, especially people without experience in the field, may miss that. And I think getting then the next level of an evaluation by somebody with experience is good. Yes. And so in your experiences, um, what are the most common misdiagnoses or inappropriate diagnoses of autism in a child where the child truly does not have autism but there's some other uh, clinical condition present? I think ADHD is one that frequently comes up. I think um, sometimes kids have bad ADHD, they have trouble paying attention, they seem in that way that they don't stay focused, they don't form relationships, they move around a lot and we sometimes find people miss that diagnosis. Um, Sometimes for a child that is having a lot of difficulties, intellectual disability might be missed. Sometimes a hearing disorder, um, other kinds of medical disorders can be missed. But I'd say the ones that I see, we see most often in our STAR clinic at UCSF uh, is either ADHD or anxiety disorders. I, I, I would think. agree that social anxiety, severe social anxiety, can appear sometimes to parents and teachers, or at least raise the question of uh, whether a child has an autism spectrum disorder, especially because sometimes those children retreat into a special interest that they become very um, expert and knowledgeable at because they're alone a lot of the time, um, and it's a compensatory behavior circumscribed interest. I would say sometimes also kids with disruptive behavior difficulties who are having a hard time socializing, 
and, uh, and may be also affected by ADHD type symptoms. Uh, those are kids who might be somewhat socially isolated and their attentional difficulties make it maybe problematic for them to sustain social interactions. Um, so, and it can be a tough call at times in, in making the distinction between somebody who has some spectrum-like real symptoms versus a child who maybe has anxiety, social difficulties, and, uh, and significant attentional problems. And are there any particular um, difficult or thorny issues that you encounter when a uh, child has some degree of intellectual disability and there's a question of autism? Well, I think the communication abilities, uh, the... Um, and teasing out what component is from yeah. intellectual disability versus what component might or might not be autism. Yeah, I think that is often a challenge, especially if we're talking about kids that are really pretty um, impaired. So then you say, and we get to a point sometime where we say we can't make this distinction and uh, to call it autism or to call it intellectual disability. Although I usually would rather at least see if there is anything that's part of the autism diagnosis that might be able to respond rather than have it solely be intellectual disability, but I think it helps for parents and teachers and other caretakers to figure that out. Often it's hard to test kids with a lot of intellectual disabilities when they're young and to fully know, you know, how is that going? Uh, what, what is this? Is it autism or something else? Um, one often hears that there's urgency in making an early diagnosis so that early behavioral intervention can be uh, started. What's the evidentiary underpinning of this? And a related question is, does developmental potential stagnate or stop in an older child or adult who has autism? The early diagnosis does seem to make a big difference. The brain is more plastic, it's more malleable, there's a way that interventions can have more of an impact on this growing brain, especially when it's young. And there are some interventions like the Early Start Denver model that have started interventions as early as a year or a year and a half, and they've shown that kids do really well, and there have been some that show if they start later, they don't show quite as much change. That's no reason to be discouraged, to say, oh, I missed that window of opportunity, because the window stays open for, for a long time. But the earlier, the better. And so I think making that diagnosis, getting to early intervention, even if you're not 100% confident of the diagnosis, if you get some whiff of it, those interventions still make a difference. It isn't, though, over by the time you reach adolescence or young adulthood. We have studies that show that the brain continues to change, continues to uh, be malleable, to show ways that it grows and that it doesn't grow, that says it's important to think about how to make interventions. And maybe the change is not as great, but the change is still there. So we're increasingly coming to appreciate that intervention throughout the whole life cycle is really worth it. No. I agree. And based on your practices and all the, the, the literature that deals with these questions, what are still some of the major gaps in our knowledge regarding doing interventions and seeing their impacts? What areas do you feel most strongly need to be addressed um, at this time? Well, I think a lot of the um, uh, discouragement about outcomes in autism have come, we have to remember that they were done on clinical samples. And there's a phenomenon called the clinician's bias where uh, people who continue to have needs or who continue to have serious deficits are going to remain in care and continue to get services. And I don't think even now we have a good sense in the general population 
as people mature in age, um, that there may be some people with early difficulties who really recover substantially. Um, and in my clinical practice, certainly my observation is that I worked with patients who by the time they're in their verbal, if they're verbal, uh, that by the time they're in their 40s and 50s, um, they are mature adults um, and really doing quite well. And I, some have been married, had children, um, so I don't think we have the full picture yet. The heterogeneity in longitudinal course prob is probably equal to the heterogeneity you know, at baseline. So this to me is really interesting because it doesn't speak to a notion that's present in the general press about autism, that there's a subgroup who've had substantial or recovery, mm -hmm. quote unquote, from their autism. So that would seem to me to be a, a very important research issue to get more knowledge on. Mm -hmm. yeah. Some people do recover a, a fair amount, and some people have a hard time, and it's often difficult for parents, I feel like when we give a hopeful lecture saying you can really make a difference and parents say, gosh, I tried everything that I could think of, I did everything that I could and my child didn't, is there something wrong with me or did I not do everything right? And I think it goes back to the different kinds of autism that we, we haven't subtyped it in a way and sometimes it may be that a particular technique would have done better for somebody or it could be that someone doesn't have as much opportunity to show this really large kind of gain. And I feel uncomfortable for parents that then feel like, oh, here I, you know, this didn't work out well for me. But it's good to be hopeful no matter what. And I think that there is progress uh, that can be made. Yeah, I, I think as part of it too, the, the, the kids who end up doing quite well, are also generally involved in a lot of intensive treatments and the um, and thinking uh, here now the the kids who I saw when where they were a year and a half two years of age got them involved in early intervention intensive services and this is 30 to 40 hours a week of one-on-one -on -one services um, I had a, a kid uh, just this past summer um, I saw him the first month. I started working at the uh, Ladders Clinic, the autism clinic, um, and he is uh, getting ready to go to college. And uh, he has some things that you know I notice maybe because I've worked with him for so long um, that are um, reflective of the diagnosis, but in a very subtle way. But again, it, it, he he got. Uh, early services um, at a year and a half when he was initially diagnosed. So, um, so uh, which children do well with those services um, and which don't? Yes, is an area that it would an important one that we need to know more about. So yeah, just yeah. hearing from what you're all saying, it seems that a big research need is continued work on further defining subtypes at genetic levels and other levels and uh, describing meticulously their clinical history, natural histories, and determining which types of um, behavioral and educational and in some cases medical interventions uh, would be most beneficial to that child. Certainly, um, the development of language seems to be key to a favorable prognosis, but if we view spoken language as a, it's the most common method of communication, but I think there's more interest now in developing the literacy skills of children with autism. Sometimes children are better able to write than they are to speak, and um, uh, use of assistive technologies to help them communicate in other ways than through spoken language seem to hold some promise. That's really interesting. Um, we now know after probably the last 20 or so years of attention to this topic that there's a considerable number of medical and neurological and psychiatric um, comorbidities 
that can occur in children and adults with autism. Um, what are some of the more common and most important psychiatric comorbidities in pediatric autism, and what are their approximate frequencies? Well, it, one of the issues with making co-diagnoses of other uh, psychiatric disorders with autism is that there's so much overlap often of symptomatology. So um, with autism spectrum, you have uh, features of anxiety that are related to uh, the behavioral rigidities and uh, this sort of need for sameness. Um, you have uh, generally, if not almost always, attentional issues that are uh, perhaps related to language difficulties or whatever the core social problem is. Uh, but attentional uh, difficulties are common. Um, and, uh, and then you can often have trouble with mood reactivity, irritability, and aggression. So um, diagnosis-wise, um, uh, ADHD is uh, uh, often attentional issues, hyperactivity and impulsivity that are part of an ADHD diagnosis. Uh, there is significant comorbidity with those symptoms and uh, ASD. Uh, it, prior to the DSM-5, uh, ADHD was excluded uh, as a diagnosis if somebody had been diagnosed with ASD. Uh, and the ranges of, of uh, comorbidity, um, it, depending on the study, you're looking at 30 to over 90%. Um, and again, it, this is, uh, the, the variability depends on the, the means of, of how the, the children or adults were assessed, but it just speaks to the overlap in the symptomatology that uh, the, that the uh, comorbidity has been reported as high as over 90%. Um, anxiety disorders, um, again, you have uh, a significant amount of uh, anxiety as part of ASD that is generally a part, or you would think of as part of the need for sameness and some of the obsessionality and perseverativeness associated with the diagnosis. Um, uh, making a separate uh, anxiety disorder uh, diagnosis is again complicated, um, it ranges in studies 15 to 40 percent, I think in that range. Um, and maybe others have understood it differently, but my review is around that. Um, and uh, I would say another major comorbid psychiatric problem are mood disorders. And uh, this, especially as it overlaps with irritability, agitation, and aggression uh, with kids or adults on the spectrum, um, this is, a, 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 you're going to get a lot of variability in, uh, um, in uh, the reported prevalence of uh, mood disorders, depression in people with uh, autism or children with autism with ranges from 10 to 50 plus percent, okay? So um, uh, the point is there's probably, uh, as part of the diagnosis, some mood vulnerability or at least difficulty uh, with containment of mood symptoms. Um, and uh, you also, too, have the disorder that as it is, um, the children are, have struggles socially, uh, social struggles are going to affect affect and mood. So. Um, so those are some of the, I think, important psychiatric comorbidities. Um, yeah. There have been some um, s kind of uh, disturbing studies, too, mm -hmm. about the suicide incidents mm -hmm. in adolescents with autism spectrum disorders and depression. Um, mm -hmm. They face those challenges of adolescence. They feel ostracized, as you were yeah. saying. and. There, there have been a couple studies, one really good one, that is one done in, in the U.S. and one done in the U.K., suggesting that the suicide rate's higher. And I really feel cautious uh, as I work with families that have an adolescent who might be feeling de 
crest and trying to help them be sure that they watch for the signs to make an early intervention. Yeah, I think uh, adolescents, middle school, high school, children who are more socially able can often, I think, suffer more in terms of mood or distress because they can more uh, 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 maybe uh, clearly experience uh, their um, difficulties and their level of self-awareness um, uh, is uh, as related to um, the social struggles is more intense than um, it's very difficult for these kids and they are at risk uh, for perhaps suicidal behavior, aggression in general. Um, uh, and this is again as part of uh, mood expressions that can happen with uh, the children on the spectrum. But sometimes even in the absence of a diagnosable depression, I think the goals that can be set for themselves met, might be unrealistic or uh, rigidly held to in the, uh, and there's such a discouragement factor independent of can be independent of depression. I'd also like to mention that uh, catatonia, or a history of catatonia is present in 20% of persons with autism. And whether that is basically a, a mood-based, you know, a profound um, kind of catatonia based in depression, I think is not, not really clear. Um, no, I don't think we even thought of that a few yeah. years ago. I mean, right. Some you have written about yeah. this and it's been kind of like a new thing for us mm -hmm. to consider in terms of what yeah. to do but for kids that are either very locked in or right. kind of very excited yes. to at least consider that. I don't mm -hmm. know if you can say more about what catatonia is and how parents and family members might recognize it Well, and physicians. Yeah. I think um, Catatonia is a neurological disorder, um, and it's primarily expressed through uh, motor symptoms. So a child who is standing still in one place for hours at a time, um, or staring into space for hours at a time, when that may be either an exaggeration of a pre-existing behavior or a new onset of behavior, um, or who holds unusual postures, uh, catatonia might be con considered and I think the good news is that it seems to respond to the same treatment that catatonia outside of autism responds so that would be benzodiazepines or in some cases um, using ECT. Um, so. And for our viewers who aren't familiar with the um, abbreviation ECT is electroconvulsive therapy. Um, the existence of autism in a child has impacts not only for that child but for others in the family, like any siblings and for parents of the child. Um, can you speak about um, some of the impacts for siblings and for parents of having a child with autism in a family? Well, uh, t certainly the um, uh, four siblings uh, of children who are on the spectrum, it's a stressor within the family. Um, there is a good amount of research on siblings and uh, children with autism, uh, some of which show that there's increased problems with uh, 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 different psychiatric disorders or um, mental health related problems. Um, uh, some of the studies don't show uh, so much in the way of uh, uh, diagnosable, increased risk of sort of diagnosable psychiatric problems. Um, uh, the, um, the, the, uh, the, the problems for the sibling may in part be related to the degree of severity of the sibling um, and their, uh, of their autism symptoms along with perhaps uh, uh, the intellectual disabilities that might be associated and as part of it too, the subsequent behaviors, overall uh, comorbid 
uh, psychiatric diagnoses in the child with autism. Um, for parents, uh, it's uh, uh, say the obvious. It's it's a, it's a major challenge for parents at times, uh, depending on the uh, types of behaviors and the severity that the child is having with um, uh, with the, the diagnosis of autism. Um, uh, the, there's a fair amount of uh, literature on this subject also. Um, uh, whether there's some uh, bi-directional influences here uh, that um, uh, the children who are having difficulties with behaviors, uh, disruptive behaviors and aggression might then uh, influence uh, the uh, distress in a parent and the distress in the parent then might influence the behavior of the child. Okay, um, So uh, um, all these should be attended to as part of clinical work with a child with autism. Parenting for sure and being aware of uh, impacts on siblings and sibling-child interactions. And in addition to professionals like the three of you, professionals in the field of child psychiatry, what are some other resources that are available to assist siblings with whatever issues they may be experiencing as a result of having someone in their family with autism, and what are some of the resources that you folks use to help the parents? I think uh, for people who live in larger communities, they have the advantage of perhaps having groups, so like the siblings or parent support groups. For people that live in more isolated or rural areas, it's hard to get enough people together to be able to get that kind of support. There are some good, uh, at least descriptive programs like that Autism Speaks has uh, that you, one can get by going to the internet. There's some books written by people that have talked about having a sibling or a parent. Um, you know, I, I, I've read statistics that go as high as 80% divorce rate among parents who have a child with autism, that uh, it's often the mother who's left with the child and the father goes off and then the, how they get support, how they work and what other kinds of resources and I do find at times that moms can bond together, um, schools can help offer those kinds of supports for the parents at some of the schools I work at we do and, and yet in r more rural areas I think that's often a challenge and often a good activist parent makes a difference. A mom once asked me, what did I think was the most hopeful sign for a child with autism? And I said, having a parent that's a good advocate. So I think for parents to be able to try to put these resources together can make a difference for them and a difference for their child. And the three of you are academics. What type of additional research do you feel is most needed? in terms of the issue of impacts and in terms of the general issue of figuring out best resources and policy, best policies? Well, I certainly think we need to better understand the financial and long-term life impact on parents of having a child with, with autism and um, what it means uh, when you have a two-parent family um, and let's say the mother is unable to work because she is taking care full time um, of the child with autism, um, how does that affect the family finances and, and long-term outcomes? Um, so I don't think we've really done good studies of what happens with families, particularly as their children become adults, and uh, then what happens to those parents in terms of having resources for retirement because they may have spent um, savings that would otherwise have gone to retirement on a child. And probably, as a nation, we are not mobilized enough yet to help these families. You know, a question that I often feel awkward asking, but I wonder, and I find some parents volunteer to me, is what has this done for your spiritual life? 
But what has this done for the way that you define the meaning of your life, um, having a child? And I have some parents that tell me, you know, it was very, very difficult, but it's added a lot. And I find sometimes parents that stay together will say that somewhat easier. But I, I don't know whether it's our place to ask that question, but I think people come to a really challenging part of their life, and I, I hope somebody asks so that they can talk about what is this do to how I think about the meaning of my life and how, how do I define that because I think some of them struggle with that a lot and it would be good to have somebody to listen. You've covered a number of really important general matters in child psychiatry uh, affecting or involving pediatric persons um, with autism, are there any sort of fine comments you'd like our viewers to hear from you about any of these general matters that we've spoken of? Well, I think I would just like to say that I think uh, pediatricians and child psychiatrists in communities, particularly as a group in uh, urban communities, but also as individuals in more rural communities are one of the most important advocates for this group of children and um, need to bring the needs of these children to the attention of school boards and uh, social service agencies. Well, thanks so much, all of you. Really appreciate your expertise. Would it be okay if I 